I'd like to keep these memories in frames of gold and silver and reminisce a year from now about the smiles we've shared but above all else I hope you will come to know the Father's love when you see the Lord face to face you'll hear him say well done will you love Jesus more when we go our separate ways when this moment is a memory will you remember his face will you look back and realize you've sensed his love more than you did before i pray for nothing less than for you to love Jesus more. I pray for nothing less than for you to love Jesus more. Woo, that was powerful. Pray for nothing less than for you to love Jesus more. And tonight, we're going to have an opportunity. There's that slide. We have an opportunity to learn more about Jesus. And I pray that, friends, you get to experience the blessing of, uh, of knowing Jesus more through this series. And if you haven't already, I, I just let me know. Let's talk because uh, I hope in all the talk about prophecy and, and the future and current events that we've all discovered a deeper connection with God through it. This is where I believe a revival comes and studying Jesus and the truth and being ready for what's coming in these last days. Let me make a few announcements here and then we're going to get started. Um, so supper tonight. So after this meeting is over, um, I'm sure I'll work up an appetite and, yeah, and then we'll go eat some food. But we won't stay long because I've got two presentations. Let me tell you what, my presentations this evening are packed. I, I was saying earlier, I've got actually four presentations tonight but I'm compressing them down into two. Uh, by the way, if you ever would like to hear more, um, like I, I've got a longer series out there that you can go check out. It's actually, I've got a YouTube channel called Bible Mythbusters, and I've got a card out there, a little business card uh, at the foyer that'll take you to Bible Myth, BibleMythbusters.org, which actually, which actually redirects you to um, the YouTube channel. So, BibleMythbusters.org, and you can go actually listen to these two presentations as four if you'd like to. They're a little older presentations. I've presented them a while back, but uh, the, 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 most of the material is still relevant. The Bible doesn't change, amen? Times might change. I also want to encourage you to check your Bible school lessons. Uh, you might be missing some. Uh, we just have a few more lessons to give out, and we're going to be done with the Bible school, and then we're going to have a graduation this, come sa this coming Saturday morning. So this next Saturday morning, if you've been doing the Bible school, we want to be able to present you with a gift and a diploma and all that. And so we're also going to be giving away this family Bible to somebody who's come to the most nights. So uh, that's going to be coming up. And then right now, I've got a drawing. I've got a drawing now, and I've got a drawing at my next presentation. So let's go ahead. I'm going to save my other drawing for later. This one here is called Final Empire. This is a presentation. If you haven't heard, uh, Sean Boonster, he's the president of Voice of Prophecy. This uh, DVD is going to have a presentation about the United States of America and its role in last day prophecy, and it's really good. And so it's actually uh, four different presentations here. And uh, so I really want to encourage you. Uh, you know, you can actually go to voiceofprophecy.org or go on YouTube, and you can check out some of his presentations as well. Uh, he's a a lot more powerful speaker than I am, I promise you that. He's, uh, really, he's one of my favorite preachers, so uh, I'll, I'll tell you that. All right, let's go ahead and do a drawing now. Let me get my app open here. I know some of you have won before, uh, but if you win again, I just, I'll, I'm glad for you. But since most everybody's won, let's see here. Night number 16 is going to be Charlene. All right. 
Congratulations. Excellent. Congratulations. Uh-huh. All right. Well, like I said, I've got a lot to cover tonight, so we're going to get moving into it pretty fast. Um, now, right here is the seminar I was telling you about coming this next Saturday evening is opening night. Saturday, May 21st at 7 p.m. Uh, it's going to be right here. There's Elder Wilson, and it's going to be the Warren Performing Arts Center. And again, if you wanted to get registered for that, here's the website for you to do so. And you, you guys should have received um, an actual flyer with this information on it. If you didn't get this flyer, talk to the registration table and said, hey, Pastor Wyatt said you're going to give me a flyer. So be sure to get that before you leave. Okay, um, tonight at 7.30, Return of the Woman. We're going to talk a little bit about Israel in prophecy. We're going to look at um, why there's so many different denominations out there. We're going to look at this Revelation 12 woman. It's a lot going to be packed into our next presentation. Uh, pray for me as I try to keep it. I want, I want us to be done by 8.30 tonight. By God's grace, we can do that, okay? And if by God's grace, He can help us if we don't. But anyway, oh, <laughs> Uh, Tuesday, 7 p.m., very important, the testimony of Jesus. You know, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17 says, here's the patience of the saints, here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus, okay? What is the testimony of Jesus? Very important, and so we're going to talk about that on Tuesday. And then on Wednesday, the ultimate mind game, where we're going to pull back uh, the curtain on the universe and see some things that are going on in the, behind the scenes as, as the devil tries to attack us and and convince us I, I tell you there is a trojan horse going on and satan is being very successful in the church and i'm gonna i'm gonna uh, pull back the curtain on that one and then friday my testimony personal or forever freedom it's my personal testimony and again we have uh some dates here for baptism uh, listen i know we've been moving really fast in this series by god's grace if you're ready by this saturday we would love to have some baptisms this sabbath morning uh, if you would rather wait a week, we can spend some time maybe on a personal level studying, preparing. Um, May 28th is another opportunity for baptism. We're actually going to be at the Warren Performing Arts Center, and so we may have some baptisms there. And then you have June 18 is going to be a camp meeting where Christians are going to come from all across the state, sometimes from even other states, and they're going to have a huge gathering up in Cicero. And uh, so if you feel like, you know what, I just need to spend some more time studying, we want to be able to work for that date. So write those dates down. Let me know which date you would prefer if the Lord is speaking to you about baptism, okay? All right, I'm ready to get started. You ready to say the motto with me? If it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it's not, I don't need it. Amen. Uh, well, tonight's presentation, which is obviously Sunday at 530, is called The Mark of the beast. And tonight we'll also look at the United States and Bible prophecy. Now, before I get into this presentation and before I pray, I just want to share with you that, that I believe that tonight's topic is one of the most solemn topics of prophecy. We're going to see in a moment the dire warnings that God gives about those who get the mark of the beast. So as we pray together tonight, let's ask God's special help in understanding it, okay? So pray with me tonight. Oh, Father in heaven, uh, as I share from your sacred scriptures, especially here in this, uh, this last book of the Bible, and as I talk about the mark of the beast, Lord, it's a humbling thought that there's going to be a lot of people who receive it, uh, many because they weren't studying their Bibles, many because uh, they could care less. Others are going to receive it, Father, because um, they, even though if they knew, they just chose the world over you. God, tonight, as we talk about this subject, I pray for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon us tonight and anybody watching right now, that we would understand this with clarity, but more than anything else, we would understand the importance of receiving your seal and making a, making a decision every day so that we do not, we're not even tempted to get the mark of the beast. Father, we pray this with confidence in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our soon coming King. Amen. I call my presentation tonight simply the mark of of the beast. Now again, I don't want anybody to be offended at how direct I'm going to be tonight. And Paul had uh, shared here in Romans 9.33 that, that there's going to be a messages that will cause stumbling. Look at this. It says, as it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Well, we need to put our faith in Jesus so we're not put to shame or offended tonight. I like how, Galatia, how Paul put it in Galatians 4.16. He says, have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth. I hope tonight 
we can depart as friends, right? And we can part as friends and that you would still, uh, you know, pray for me and I'll pray for you even if at the end of the night some of the things I say might be a little bit personal, right? So what we're going to look at is Revelation chapter 13 and Revelation chapter 14. Revelation 13, in our next chapter, we're actually going to go back to chapter 12 and peek in that and look in chapter 17 as well. But Revelation 13 and 14, and we're going to talk about the danger of getting the mark of the beast. And it is dangerous, friends. And then we're going to identify what the mark of the beast is. Let's back up first to Revelation 14 and verse 6. This is the first of the three angels' messages. You know, there's three messages the world has to hear before Jesus comes back. The first angel's message says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the what kind of gospel? everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth to every nation kindred tongue and people saying with a loud voice fear god and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth the sea and the fountains of waters so here according to the first angel's message it's a worldwide message it tells people to fear god give glory to him it talks about judgment hour being here already and then it's a message of worship it's a message that calls God's people to true, genuine worship. And we're going to look at that a little bit tonight. The second angel's message, which I'll be preaching here in just a little bit, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, first of all, most people don't even know who Babylon is. So how can you preach that Babylon is fallen if you don't know who Babylon is? So in our next presentation, we're going to talk about who Babylon is and why Babylon is fallen. Now, that's the, that's the second angel's message. The world needs to know this. The, the world needs to know it, but Christians aren't even talking about it, much less preaching about it. We need to make sure this is part of our message. And then the third angel's message, this is the one that's pivotal for tonight, okay? This is the one we need to take heed to this evening. It says, the third angel follow them saying with a loud voice it's not a silent message not a quiet message don't whisper this one with a loud voice if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or where in his hand the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of god which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation before i go on let me just make it very clear if you get the mark of the beast you will be lost if you get the mark, if you get the mark of the beast, you will receive the wrath of God, which according to Revelation uh, chapter 15 and 16, the wrath of God's talking about the seven last plagues. Then it talks about here, Revelation 14, 10, he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. You don't want that. You're going to ultimately end up in the lake of fire if you receive the mark of the beast. So I'm going to guess right now, just by seeing the, your faces and, and, and getting to know you over the last few weeks. You don't want the mark of the beast. I don't want the mark of the beast. I don't want my family to get it. I don't want my loved ones, my neighbors. In fact, I don't want anybody to get the mark of the beast. And that's why I'm sharing this message tonight. And that's why I'm going to keep it very straight with you. But everybody wants to know, what is the mark of the beast? Now, there's a lot of theories out there. In fact, a lot of books, a lot of movies, a lot of Hollywood has made the mark of the beast kind of uh, popular. But everybody wants to know what it is. Well, you ask 10 preachers, you're going to get 11 answers. I've heard so many things. Of course, does anybody, was anybody around? You're gonna, you're gonna you can tell me your age, but is anybody around when, when, when the, whenever the, the serial um, the serial numbers and the barcodes first started coming out? Does anybody remember when that started hitting store shelves? I, I got to admit, I wasn't around. I mean, maybe I was around, but I don't remember it. But I've heard from people that said, you know, when these first started put, being put on clothes and food in the supermarket, I, oh, watch out! You just uh, buy everything. Go to the stores that don't use barcodes. They would say. And um, <laughs> now, can you buy anything without a barcode? And they were saying, look, watch out for the barcode. because." And I do remember this when I was studying this out. They're like, watch out for the barcodes because it has the number 666 embedded in the barcode. So every time you buy something. So if this is the case, is there anybody in this room right now who doesn't have the mark of the beast? I'm sure we're all wearing clothes right now that one day had to be scanned at some point. We've all eaten food that had to be scanned. So this is not the mark of the beast not just because everybody's doing it it's not the mark of the beast because it doesn't fit what the bible says we're going to see why in just a moment the probably the most popular thing uh in fact tonight after i i, I sent out my i sent out a text message to my group saying to all of you guys saying hey come out tonight we're going to talk about how the mark of the beast is not a microchip somebody texted me back and said yes it is i said well come out let me hear the evidence that it's not i, I, I don't i'm not trying to offend anybody but the truth is 
It can't be a, it can't be a microchip. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you though, this is the most popular teaching out there today. The idea that you know you're going to be implanted with a chip. I remember whenever the vaccines first started coming up, people were like, oh, they're going to put a chip in you, right? Or I remember, and actually, right now, there's um, uh, it, it is interesting. Uh, Elon Musk is actually putting chips in people's heads. Like he, they're, he's, they're doing trials and they're testing things, and and you know, and, but you know, nobody's really talking about that. But I just find it fascinating that people think that this is going to be the mark of the beast. Now, let me say this. There might be a time coming when people are putting chips in people's bodies, okay? In fact, it's already happening in some places. Some businesses, they, they let their op, uh, employees op, opt into this thing where you put a chip in your, in your hand, and you go up and you want to get something out of the vending machine, boop, boop, and you, get, yeah, you want to check in for work, boop, boop, you just check in right with your hand. And that's actually happening in some places in the world. And in fact, the more it happens... The more Christians go, oh, see, I told you. But the problem is, the, the, if the mark of the beast is a microchip, you've got several problems that come along with it. And you're going to see here in a minute why the microchip cannot be the mark of the beast. In fact, I'm going to tell you something. If, if it was the mark of the beast, I'm going to tell you right now, you've already got it. Everybody, take your phone out and hold, hold it in your right hand. Do you guys realize right now you have a chip in your right hand? Did you realize that right now? You have not just one chip, you have tons of chips, microchips in your right hand. If it's in your right hand. You, could, you don't put it on your head, do you? In your head? You put it back in your pocket, in your purse, or whatever. But the point is, is that microchips are already out there. If they wanted to track you, they already can. That's not a problem. You know, if they want to shut down your money, it's already in place. But, as, but as, as crazy as that may be, a microchip right here in underneath the skin and right here on my hand really doesn't make much of a difference. It doesn't make much of a difference. If this, what's the difference between this one and it's actually in the hand? See what I'm saying? Use your logic. It doesn't really fit. Besides the point that it's not, it doesn't meet the criteria of being the mark of the beast. We'll see in a second. Some have suggested, well, what about the Google Chrome. Google must be the mark of the beast because look at the look at this icon, six six six, embedded in there. Now let me tell you what. This is not the mark of the beast. Now I you know what I do think it is. I think Satan. He just he toys with people, and I think he's you know he's always inspiring. As you know, I think Satan inspires Hollywood. The way they make these movies and TV shows that get people gripped and watching for hours that forget to use the bathroom and eat or whatever. I mean, you know that Satan's behind all that to capture people's attention. Well, Satan, I think, toys with people and creates these things that... You know, look at this one. Look at Walt Disney, for example. See how the number 666 is kind of embedded in the name Walt Disney? Isn't that interesting? Now, it's not the mark of the beast. You know, I don't, I don't doubt, by the way, that there's a lot of danger and satanic stuff in, in Walt Disney. You know that Disney stuff, every single Disney movie ever out there deals with magic and spiritualism. And, you know, it's just all of it is. It's, it's definitely satanic beginning to end. I mean, I'm not some conspiracy theorist to come up with that. But it's not the mark of the beast, right? And then I, came, I saw this one. I saw a YouTube video about this. It was hilarious. This person, okay, so watch this now. In the Hebrew language... You have the different Hebrew letters. You can see them here on the screen. You got uh, Alpha, Bet, Gamil, Daleth, Ga, or Aleph, Bet, Gamil, Daleth, He, and Va. Va. Va is the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Va kind of looks like this on the Monster Energy drinks, right? And so that's Va, Va, Va. That's 666. Six, six. And then to add to that, look at what it says in the corner Unleash the beast. The mark of the beast is Monster Energy drinks, friends. If you've ever had one of these, you've got the mark of the beast, according to these folks. Now, again, I just think it's the devil toying around. I don't really think that it's actually the mark of the beast. Uh, not, you know, far from it. But uh, what about this one? This one's been the most popular one lately. People are talking about, well, perhaps, the, the, you know, especially at the height of the pandemic or whenever the, the, uh, the vaccines first started coming out, everybody's like, oh, don't get the vaccine. It's, it's the mark of the beast. It's the mark of the beast. And, you know, and, I, and, I, and I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this from a personal perspective. You know, I, I always urge people to really seriously consider what they put in their body for their health's sake. Their body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, you know, especially when it comes to vaccines and it, they make so much money and there's, you know, the injury list and all that stuff. So I would say be cautious, be careful before you make that decision. Yes, but it's your decision, right? But as bad as it might be for some, it's not the mark of the beast. It can't be the mark of the beast. It doesn't fit the qualifications of what the mark of the beast is. Now, what is the main qualification for something to be the mark of the beast? 
Here it is, friends. This is what's going to blow all the stuff out of the water. Ready? Worship. The mark of the beast is a worship issue. I cannot believe people, they, they, they read through all Revelation 13, where it talks about worship, 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 worship. Revelation 14, worship, worship, worship. And they ignore all of that because they want it to fit within their, their, their preconceived ideas or what some you know, novel out there, some movie out there has made famous. And friends, it, do, it does not fit to have anything other than something that specifically deals with the subject of worship. In fact, Revelation 15 times focuses on, on worship as the central issue of the last days. The central issue of the last days. And that's what it is regarding the mark of the beast. So I'm going to submit to you tonight. Here's my case I'm going to make. And I'm going to see if I, you know, hold me to it. See if I can't demonstrate this tonight. That the mark of the beast is not 666. First of all, that is the number of the beast. That's the number of a man. It is not a chip. In fact, it's not even physical. The mark of the beast is a spiritual mark. And I'm going to make it, I'll share two thoughts with you to help establish that. Number one, you can go back, to, you know, again, anytime you want to understand something in Revelation, you've got to go back to the Old Testament. You go back to the Ezekiel chapter 9, and there was an angel who was going around putting marks on God's people. And the mark that they received kept them from being slaughtered on the day when the Lord came around and slaughtered everybody, right? He says, start in the temple of God. You go back to Ezekiel 9, read that story there. But notice, in that story, it was a mark the angels put on people's heads. Nobody could see. Angels, heaven, they, could, they knew the difference. They knew who had the mark. They knew who did not have the mark. But it was not a mark that was physical. And I want you to understand that. Secondly, here's how I know that it's not a physical mark. Let's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you two illustrations here. I want you to imagine that it was a microchip, okay? And let's just say you have a neighbor. You know, he's way back out there in the woods, and he's got those signs up, you know, uh, you know, don't trespass or I'm going to kill you and all that stuff. You know, we got, we got guns, we got security cameras, I got dogs that will eat you as well, and all that stuff. So, but, but here comes the government, and the government comes to this guy. Now, you've got to realize, this guy, he's not even a Christian. He doesn't believe in God. He doesn't care about spiritual things. And the government comes to him and says, knock, 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 we're going to put a microchip in your body. Now imagine, this is, this is using the scenario that the microchip is the mark of the beast. So knock, 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 we're going to put the microchip into your body, and the, what do you think the guy's going to say? Get off my property, or I'm going to put some lead in you, <laughs> right? That's probably what, what's going to happen here. And so, okay, so they, so they, 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 they run away, right? So let's just say, here, here, let me ask the question. So he doesn't get the microchip. But he's not a believer. Question. Does, has he then refused the mark of the beast? Is he then going to get the seal of God because he rejected the mark of the beast? You see, if it was physical, if it was a, simply a physical thing, by rejecting it, all, right out rejecting it, does that mean that he's saved? No, because we're not saved by that, right? Does that make sense? Let me give you, let's flip the scenario around. Let's just say you're a believer. You love Jesus with all your heart. You're doing your, your very best to be faithful to Him, keeping all of His commandments and everything, right? And they come to your house and they say, give me, let me give you this microchip. We're going to put this microchip in your hand or your forehead. And you say, I'm a Christian. No, thank you. They say, we're not asking. We're telling you. And then you say, you know what? I don't believe you. And they knock you out. So now you're out cold. You're laying on the ground. And they take a microchip and they put it in you while you're unconscious. You wake up. You feel a little pain where they put the microchip in. My question is this, do you now have the mark of the beast? If that's the mark of the beast and they forced it in you, do you, still, do you have the mark of the beast? You see, friends, you can't force the mark of the beast. If you wake up and you've got all of a sudden somebody knocks you out and put this in you, the mark of the beast has to be chosen. Does that make sense? It has to be chosen. And just the fact that you reject something physical doesn't mean that you're all of a sudden saved. Here's my point. The mark of the beast has, is an issue that deals with the heart and with our attitude toward God. It deals with worship. Does that make sense? And so, again, when we, we're going to see this bear out here. Here it is, again, the first angel's message tells us to worship him that made heaven and earth the sea and the fountains of waters. This is a, a commandment. I'm going to tell you this. Not a commandment, a, um, a message that the world has to hear a message to come back to worship God as creator. And this is in a generation where everybody, including a lot of Christians, are forgetting that God's our creator. Most churches today 
and I'm, I mean this, you can check, check me on this, most churches today, the grand majority of churches that call themselves Christian, teach a form of evolution. Not just that. The worship that God is asking from people, most Christians reject. You know, people think, well, I, I go to church every week, and I, I raise my hands, and I sing loud, and, I, and they think that's worship. I you know, check that off my check the box off. I've worshiped this week. Friends, you know what worship is? Worship begins on a, on a daily basis when you get up in the morning and you give your heart to Jesus, you spend time with him in his word, getting to know the word of God for yourself, praying to him, right? Getting on your knees if you can. Right? In fact, the, the word worship all throughout the Old Testament, it was almost synonymous with getting on your knees. In almost every case, they, they worshiped and bowed down. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the God, our Maker. That's that. But here's the thing. Today, no, no, no. People, you hear the word worship, and you think loud music. It's almost in almost every case today. That's not the worship of the Bible. The worship of the Bible brings you back to obedience. The worship of the Bible brings you back to acknowledging God as your Creator, and you submitting to Him your life and your will on a daily basis. That's the true worship. That's the worship that God accepts. And so here we have a message that goes around the world to worship Him that made... Now, I want you to notice this. Heaven, the earth, the sea, the fountains of waters. You know, this is a, almost a direct quotation from the fourth commandment. The one that says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. And then I'm telling you, this, the reason people have forgotten the Sabbath is, be, is because they've forgotten true worship and obedience and loyalty to Him. Revelation presents two groups of people. One who worships the Creator and one who worships the beast. The first angel's message is a call to worship the Creator. The third angel's message is a warning against worshiping the beast. Now let me show something that's just absolutely fantastic and clear. Okay, I mentioned this once before, but it may slip past you. I want to emphasize this again. That third angel's message, the one that says, don't worship the beast. Don't, don't receive his mark in your forehead or in your hand. It goes on to tell you in verse 12, the people who don't get the mark of the beast. You ready for this? Here's the patience of the saints. Literally, here is the endurance of the saints. Here are those who put up with the trials of the last day in such a way that they do not give in. It says, here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that what? Keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. You want to know who doesn't get the mark of the beast in the last days? Commandment-keeping Christians. Commandment-keeping faithful followers of Jesus. These are the ones who do not get the mark of the beast. Everybody else will. It's that simple. What's the basis of all true worship? True worship has the basis in God being our Creator. Here you have it in Revelation 4. 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. For you have created all things, and for your pleasure they are and were created. The basis of true worship is the fact that God is our creator. You can read about this. You can actually go back in the book of Acts. How, how many times in the book of Acts they mention, you know what? God is our creator. God is our creator. Worship him that made heaven and earth the sea and the fountains of waters. Has God given us a memorial of true worship? Has he given us something to regularly remind us of who our God is? Has he given us a sign, notice that word sign, of his creative authority? And I believe the answer is yes. And I believe he put this sign right in the heart of his law. You look at the big Ten Commandments. Right in the middle of the Ten Commandments. Right in the heart of the Ten Commandments, God gives a commandment that says this. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. You see, God is our Creator, and the Sabbath is a weekly reminder of that. The base, remember, the basis of all our worship is the fact that God is our Creator, and so God gives us the Sabbath as a reminder of that. So friends, to break the Sabbath is to move away from true worship. God actually gave the, uh, the Sabbath to be a sign. He actually mentions that there in the book of Exodus chapter 31. But here I actually read it in Ezekiel 20, a prophecy that says, Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. You see, there's an identity crisis in these last days. People don't even know. And yet God has given them the Sabbath to identify who His true people are. In fact, this sign has been since the Garden of Eden. 
The true, true people of God have always kept the Sabbath down through the ages, and now you come down to the end of Earth's history. So what, right down to the last generation, or, I, or certainly one of the last generations before Jesus Christ comes, and you still have this as a sign to say, these are my people. Well, this makes a lot of sense because it all adds up. Because when you get to the book of Revelation chapter 7, God seals His servants, this last generation of people. He seals them with something. What is it He seals them with? Verse 2, Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And the words seal and sign are synonymous. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till I ha we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. I'll talk about this a little more later this week about what it means that these people are specifically sealed. But they have a seal. Where, where are they sealed at? In their forehead. Isn't that interesting? That they're sealed in their forehead. Now, it doesn't say they're sealed in their hand. We're going to find out later why. You know, so understand, first of all, the seal, you, there's really, everybody's going to receive something in their forehead or their hand, right? Either you have the seal of God or you will receive the mark of the beast. Either the seal of God or the mark of the beast. And the choice is ours. Remember, God does not force his seal on anybody. Neither can Satan force his mark on anybody. We all have a choice. Now, I'm gonna, this is really helpful to understand what the seal is because if you want to understand what the mark of the beast is, all you have to do is find out what the seal is because the seal and the mark are opposite of each other. So what is the seal of God? I shared it earlier, but you're going to see it clearly now. Isaiah 8, 16, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. Seal the law among my disciples. God wants to seal that in your heart. It's the new covenant. It was an ancient custom to bind up a document and to affix a seal on it. It isn't even just an ancient uh, custom. It's a modern custom. You want to go get anything done in a, in a very official way, and they, they put a seal on it, right? When I went to go a couple days before our wedding day, my wife and I, we went to the uh, county clerk's office, I believe it was, and uh, we got a marriage certificate. And I remember they, they got that little thing out there, that little, they put that nice big seal on there. I felt like, yes, I'm going to get married. But then, you know, I looked at the seal, and you know what I found? That still had a few elements in it. We're going to talk about those elements in just a second. Now, I'll show you an example in the Bible of a seal. Here you have it. Write ye also for the Jews. This is from Esther. The king said, Write ye also for the Jews as it liketh you in the king's name, and seal it with the king's ring. For the writing which is written with the king's name is sealed with the king's ring. May no man reverse. And so they, they would write these laws and they would seal it. And God is saying, seal the law among my disciples. Remember during the days of Jesus when he died, they, they, they put him in a tomb and they, they, they rolled a big to, uh, stone in front of the tomb of Jesus. Remember that? And then what did they put on it? A Roman seal. Remember that? Now, by the way, you can break a Roman seal. But just don't break God's seal. What is a seal? A seal actually tells us a few different things. First of all, it identifies who's in charge. It shows you, it's a level of authority, right? Who's in charge? Well, if we have the seal of God, it means God is the boss of our life. Does that make sense? But a seal also shows ownership. We belong to God. We belong if we have his seal. But then notice this, friends. It also, a seal protects and holds things together. It protects it in the sense of, you know, if a, back in the day they would take a, a document, and they, like a letter or something, they would, they, would, they would seal it. And they would send it on. And you know, if the, if the person got it and that seal was broken, somewhere along the way, somebody peeked what that document said. So you are very careful to protect that seal and keep it from breaking. In the same way, God wants to put His seal on us. Now, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, amen? If you're, if you're a Bible-believing Christian, you should have received the seal of the Holy Spirit when you were born again. Amen to that. But the Bible predicts that in the last days, there's going to be a special seal. A special seal. Again, the Holy Spirit is the one who applies it to your life. But that special seal that God puts on His people in the last days is something that's contained in His law. In fact, God's seal contains His name, his title and territory, just like that marriage certificate I got had that seal in it. It had her name on there. She was the cl county clerk, and it also said the county that she was, um, you know, that she had authority to practice in. Does God have a seal? He does. It's right in the heart of the Ten Commandments. Look at this again. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of who? The Lord your God. When you see the word Lord capitalized, 
That is God's sacred name. The tetragrammaton is called yod heh vah in Hebrew, right? It's like Yahovah. Or we translate it in the English as Jehovah, right? Jehovah. For in six days, Jehovah, Yahovah, made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now watch this, guys. If you didn't see it, reading it fast. Watch this. In God's seal, in His law, you have His name, His title as Creator of heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters, His territory. How about that? God sealed His Ten Commandment law. And remember, in the Old Covenant, the Ten Commandment law was where? On stone. In the New Covenant, where's the Ten Commandment law? It's on the heart, right? That's the, we need the heart conversion experience of God writing His law on our heart. That's the New Covenant. If you don't have His law written on your heart, you don't have the New Covenant. So God's seal stands in contrast to the beast mark. So God's seal, let me make it very clear, God's seal in a broad sense is his law. He wants to seal his law among his disciples. But in a very specific sense, the Sabbath becomes a seal or a sign that we are his people. Here it is in Hebrews 8 verse 10, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. We want God's law in our heart, don't we? It, it, I, I'm going to illustrate it like this. Have you ever, um, let me ask you, some of, okay, let me say it like this. Some of you got your driver's license a long time ago. Some of you maybe not so long ago. Let me ask you, does anybody still drive around with their driver's ed manual in their glove box? Anybody? You can, you can confess. I'm, no, no shame here. Most people don't. That's just the reality. Most people, don't. if you have it in there, you probably haven't looked at it in a long time. Let me tell you something. I would feel very scared knowing that there's somebody driving around and they see a red light and they're thinking, oh, wait, hold on. Get out the glove box. You know, let's find out what, what's the red light mean. Look it up. Okay. Right? Whew, got through that one. Now, what's that white line mean there? Oh, get the box. You know, if you're driving around having to refer to the driver's ed manual, uh-oh, you're probably not a safe driver on the road. So what do we do in school? What do we do? We, 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 we study the book. We study it. We research it. We, we look at it. We, we memorize what the signs mean to the point to where what? It becomes natural. So when you're driving down the road and you see a red light, you just immediately, you don't have to think about it. You're immediately, you see, actually, you see the yellow light. Immediately, you do one of two things. You either go, <laughs> go really fast or you put your brake on, right? But the point is, is that you want the driver's uh, manual to beware in the heart if you want to be a safe driver. God, as much as I appreciate this book right here, if we don't put it in here, you know what? We're going to have a hard time practicing it. You know, you, you, you know your, your boss asks you to lie. Well, hold on a minute. Let me check out and make sure I can do this. Uh, you, know. you know what? If you have to wait that long, temptation will overtake you and you're going to probably give in to sin. When we're tempted with sin, we need to have a direct thus saith Lord. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, remember that? It is written. And he just, three times, it is written, it is written. He knew the Word of God. And in the same way, friends, wherever you're at in your Christian journey, maybe you just got your driver's license. You know, and we're going to, give, we're going to be a little more gracious with you as you may have to look things up. But if you've been in the Christian walk for a long time, that, that driver's manual for the Christian life should be in your heart. And that's God's law. And He wants His law written in our hearts so that we will naturally do what's right. Because the time of trial is going to come where this whole world is going to, be a, is going to have a test. And whether you pass that test or not is going to come down to whether or not that law is on your heart. That, that, that's, the, that's the test. And by the way, only Jesus can write that law there. You can't write that law. You can, you can memorize the Bible and not have the law on your heart. That's where that illustration falls short. Because only the Spirit can put that law on your heart, right? Oh, and I, I'll tell you, Judas is an example of that. He followed the teachings of Jesus three and a half years, but when the test came, he failed. Friends, we need to have that law written in our heart every day. So when that test comes, we're already passing tests on a daily basis. Okay, let's move on here. Look at this, friends. According to uh, Daniel 7.25, the prophecy is that Satan, through the Antichrist, would try to change God's times and laws. And what is the law that he tried to change? We learned the other night that law was the Sabbath commandment. He tried to change the Sabbath from being from sunset Friday to sunset Saturday to be on Sunday. So since the final issue revolves around worship, what earthly religious power, power claims it has the authority to change God's law? Well, we already know the answer to that, but let's do some review here. St. Catherine Catholic Church Sentinel, May 21, 1995, says perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change the church ever did happened in the first century. I would argue with the dates on that. 
the holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday. Not from any directions noted in the Scriptures, but from the church's sense of its own power. Here's this one. The Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. They believe they changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Who made this claim? It was, the, it was man. It was, the, it was actually the church made that claim, the Roman Catholic Church. So Satan attacked God's seal, the Sabbath, the basis of all worship. And the Bible puts a name to that power. It calls it the beast. The beast is the one who is tampering with God's law. This first beast of Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 10. Now, who is that beast? Now, again, we've identified who that beast is. We, if, you, if you don't remember, we went through the different 10 points. This was last week. Go back, please watch the video. And we talk about Babylon rising uh, in this series, my other series, uh, talking about the Antichrist uh, unveiled. Uh, check out that. It's 10 indisputable points about who the Antichrist is. And what we learned that the Antichrist was the Roman Catholic Church system, right? That was the one who was attempting to change God's law, that persecuted the saints, that ruled for 1260 years, all those different things, right? And so we see that power actually rising today. It's getting stronger and stronger. The headquarters are there in Rome, in Italy. Now, now that you know who the Antichrist is, who the beast is, watch this, guys, and you... you <laughs> I'm going to say something that is, sounds so common sense, but you've missed it so many times. You, you just, here it is. You ready? The mark of the beast is the mark of the beast. Okay, let me say that again in case you missed it. The mark of the beast is the mark of the beast. Once you identify who the beast is, all you've got to ask is what's the mark of the beast? How many times have we used the phrase mark of the beast but never even had that concept? I tell you, I passed me a woo. Miss, I missed it for a long time. So finally, it's like mark of the beast. Well, if it's the mark of the beast, then all you got to do is find out who the beast is and then, then you know what his mark is, what his sign is. What's the sign or mark of the beast? Here, Actually, I'll change the language here. The mark of the beast is the mark or sign of the Roman church's authority. And does the Roman church have a mark? Does it have a sign? It does. Is it a literal sign or a symbolic sign? Well, in the Bible, when it uses the word mark of the beast, are we talking literal or symbolic? Well, the beast, is the beast symbolic or is the beast literal? The beast represents something, so the beast is symbolic. You have the image of the beast, which we'll talk about later. Is The image of the beast is symbolic. The name of the beast is symbolic. The number of the beast is symbolic. The seal of, the, of God is symbolic. And therefore, when we come to the mark of the beast, the mark is symbolic. So does the Roman Catholic Church have a mark that is symbolic? And the answer is yes. Do you want to know what that mark is? You probably already know, but here it is. Here's what they say. Out of their own mouth, here's what they declare. Of course the, Roman, the, the, of course the Catholic Church claims that the change, talking about the change from Saturday to sa Sunday, was her act. And the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. Here's another one from Catholic Record, September 1st, 1923. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of the Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. Now, you talk to your neighbor, you know, your friendly neighbor, neighbor uh, you know, who's a Catholic, and, and they probably don't know these things, right? They, 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 love, they love Jesus. They want to do what's right. These are good people. I'm not talking about the people. You understand. I'm talking about the system. Is that clear? The system that, that Satan has set up to be a counterfeit Christianity. And yes, he's deceived a lot of people. But listen, a lot of people are, are honestly deceived who are just waiting for loving Christians to come and share these messages with them, to invite them to say, you know what, this isn't right. Here's what um, this encyclical that uh, John Paul II put out, Die, uh, Dies Domini. The Sunday assembly is the privileged place of unity. It profoundly marks the church as a, as a people gathered by and in the unity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They put out this, this encyclical. It goes on to say, um, Christians, I think, I'm not sure, I, I got this quote a little bit out of order. Christians, as called as they are to proclaim the liberation won by the blood of Christ, felt that they had to had the authority to transfer the meaning of the Sabbath to the day of the resurrection. Here's another one from Dictionary of the Liturgy. Dic distinctive of the Roman Catholic Church, Sunday observance became a mark of practicing Catholic. It's another mark. So again, the mark of the beast is nothing other than 
Sunday observance, the authority, of sun, the authority to be able to claim to change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Here's what Chancellor Albert Smith said. If Protestants would follow the Bible, they should worship God on the Sabbath day. In keeping the Sunday, they are following a law of the Catholic Church. I'm telling you what, guys. Now remember, what's the central issue of Revelation? The issue is worship. And the Sabbath, remember, is the greatest opportunity that God has given us on a weekly basis of worshiping. Worshiping together, worshiping individually, worshiping as a family. Remember, when we get to heaven, the Bible says, all flesh will come and worship before me every Sabbath. The mark of the beast is simply the counterfeit papal Sabbath, the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week. Now, chew on that for a second, but I want you to not go too far with this, okay? Because I want to tell you this, nobody right now has received the mark of the beast. There's people out there who observe Sunday, okay? They keep Sunday. But even though Sunday will become the mark of the beast, it isn't the mark of the beast right now. I'm going to rephrase that. It is the mark of the beast right now, but nobody's received the mark of the beast right now. There's a difference, right? Nobody receives the mark of the beast until religious legislation is passed enforcing the substitute Sabbath. And the time's going to come when this is going to be a test question. Just like, okay, you go back, and this has actually happened once in history before. I'll tell you a little bit later. But you go back to, um, let's go back to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel 3, they were, were, everybody stood before an image, and they were told to bow down to that image. If you don't bow down to that image, you're going to the fiery furnace, right? And so three Hebrews stood tall, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They refused to bow down. That was a test. Did they pass the test? Absolutely, they passed the test. In these last days, God has a test. That, that test was based on the second commandment, by the way. In these last days, God's going to have a test based on the fourth commandment. He's looking for a people who love Jesus so much, who are so loyal to Jesus, they're willing to follow the Word of God over the Word of man. This actually happened back in the Garden of Eden. There was a test over a piece of fruit. But it's just a little piece of fruit. But it really wasn't about fruit. It was about obeying Jesus. It was about loyalty to God. And the same thing, it's not about a day. Here's the thing, people get caught up on the Sabbath and all that. It's not about a day. But it's about us following the Word of God, taking God at His Word, believing all the Bible, not just part of it. The Bible predicts a coming confederacy of religions attempting to unite church and state. And I see this. The more I listen to the news, the more I see this happening now. People coming together, trying to unite under this one banner of compromise. So let's look at verse 15, Revelation 13, 15. It says, He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause. That word cause means using force. Right, using compulsion, using coercion, that the be- image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image, the image of the beast to be killed. Now, uh, let me just go ahead and keep on. I want to say so much more, but I'm, I'm going to go, ahead, go on here. It says, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. Now, let me pause for a second. Why right hand? Why forehead? Well, I submit to you the reason that it's a right hand or forehead issue is because well, you, go, you can go back. We'll see this a little bit later. I think I have a slide on this. But you can go back to the Old Testament, and you can see that God wanted his... Uh, remember in Deuteronomy chapter 6? In fact, I'll just, pick, just quickly read this here. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Remember the Shema, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Well, right after that, God tells them that this law needs to be in their heart. But to get it in their heart, they needed to be seeing it a lot. So here's what God said. This is Deuteronomy chapter 6. It says in verse 5, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, or with all your strength. Verse 6 says, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit by the house, sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. Notice this. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. A sign on your hand? A mark on your hand. What was on the, what was a mark on their hand? The law of God. But also to put where? As a front between our eyes. Where's that? That's the forehead. God wanted his law to be on the hand and on the forehead. But here's the thing. Why the hand? Because the hand represents doing. It represents obedience. It represents following what God said. What's the forehead mean? Belief, faith, uh, acknowledging, you know, God that these things are God's word. So here's what's here's the question. Why in Revelation, when you get there, is the mark of the beast in the forehead and hand, but the seal of God is only in the forehead? Interesting question. Well, 
I want you to imagine somebody comes to me and tells me to get the mark of the beast. And I say, nope, not going to do it. But you know what? Because I, I, I know it's wrong. I shouldn't do that. But you know, they tell me, well, if you, if you don't do it, you can't buy or sell. I think, oh, no, i got to feed my family. And so I compromise and I get the mark of the beast. In that case, it symbolically goes on my hand because I'm doing it even though I don't believe it. Does that make sense? I'm doing it even if I don't agree with it. Well, if I, but then there's the group of people who say, you know what, these Sunday laws, these laws compelling people to observe Sunday, these are good laws. These are laws that, that we should all do. This is good for the environment, they would say. That this is good for the church. It's good for the family. And so they start forcing Sunday worship and get this. Those people get the mark on their forehead because they believe it. Now, why not the seal of God? Why is the seal of God only in the forehead, not the hand? Well, praise God, it was in the hand in the Old Testament, right? But you see, God wants us to obey from the heart, right? Nobody's going to work their way into heaven. Salvation is by grace through faith. We're not working our way there. So you don't get the seal of God by doing it, right? By, 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 you, know, you get it by believing it in your mind and in your heart, right? Now, it will always show by your deeds, but it's not like an option or a choice thing. You got it in your forehead and your hand, if you will, in that sense. But God wants His law written in our minds and our hearts. If that happens, you'll naturally do it anyway. Anyway, here's what happens. It says that no one may buy or sell save he that has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. This shows you that there's the mark of the beast and the number of the beast is different. Okay, But the way you get the number of the beast or the name of the beast is by obeying the beast who says he has the authority. So it's still really closely connected. All right, I can say so much more about that. Eventually, Satan is going to come and actually give a death penalty for those who don't obey. Do you realize that all through history, God's people have been troublemakers? <laughs> Isn't it true, though? I mean, you go look all through the Old Testament. You know, every time they were doing what was right, I mean, the enemy didn't like it. He was always trying to attack. He was trying to attack from outside. He was trying to attack from within. Satan never liked it. In the early church, the early church was persecuted. The early church, you know, was being fought in every direction, from the, again, from the inside, from the outside. And let me tell you something. The last generation of Christians who are standing loyal and faithful to Jesus are going to be persecuted. And you know who's going, be, who's going to be the first in persecuting Christians? Christians. I'm serious. You know, in fact, Jesus said it like this in John chapter 16. I believe it's in verse 2 or 3. He says, those who kill you will think they're doing God's service. Remember, the beast is a Christian-looking uh, uh, system, right? It looks like a Christian system. And it's going to play a part in actually persecuting God's people. It already did it in the past. It's going to do it again in the future. And to the point where... There will be a death decree. People say, how can that happen in our age? Don't we love religious liberty in these last days? Let me tell you something. It, we are moving very fast toward intolerance when it comes to God's people doing what's right. Any time somebody wants to stand up and say, that's wrong, that's right, all of a sudden, boom, you get knocked down. You're a bigot. You're, you're, a, you're a hypocrite. You're intolerant. You're, and this is happening more and more. And it's actually coming from within the church now with a louder voice. Yeah, here's what... Uh, Pope John Paul II said again, he said, therefore also in the particular circumstances of our own time, Christians will naturally strive to ensure that civil legislation respects their duty to keep Sunday holy. You see, the Catholic Church is moving to have governments enforce Sunday laws. In fact, this is already happening throughout Europe. In Poland right now, there's already Sunday closing laws. In certain places throughout Europe, they're, they're moving quickly toward this. In some places in Germany, and it's actually happening here in this nation. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says, in respecting religious liberty and the common good of all, Christians should seek recognition of Sundays and the church's holy days as what? Legal holidays. And the time it is time that we demonstrate our Catholic vitality and engage in the public policy debate. We have the power and the people to embark on this movement, a movement that will benefit all Americans. You say they think it's a good thing. This is the one who gets the mark in their forehead because they think this is a good idea. But look at this. This is 1994. We have the people in the power, they said. Let me tell you, right now, there are more people in place in the Supreme Court, in the Senate, in the House of Representatives, and even our own president is Roman Catholic. And so across the board, there are people in place. And all the, all the Pope has to do is say, here's what it's going to be. And they have to listen. In fact, there was, a, there was a president, the first American president who was Roman Catholic. You guys know him, JFK. He said, I'm not going to listen to the Pope. And how long did he last as a president? I'm not insinuating anything. I'm just saying what I said. Roman Catechism, 18, 1985. The civil authorities should be urged to cooperate with the church in maintaining and strengthening this public 
worship of God and support with their own authority the regulations set down by the church's pastor. That's a, that's a term they call the Pope. For it is only in this way that the faithful will understand why it is Sunday and not Sabbath day we keep holy. Enforcing Sunday legislation. And listen, this isn't just coming from the Catholics. We're hearing this more and more with the Protestants. So the question is, will Protestant churches unite with the beast power in urging Sunday legislation? Yes, it's already happening. They're saying, look, in fact, of all the things we disagree about, this is something we all agree with. Here's something that happened just recently. I'm going to share you, uh, with you guys a video um, that happened in, uh, this was from Sen Senator Allen from Arizona. And I'm, we're no relation, by the way. She says this. requiring an, every American to attend a church of their choice on Sunday. Sure, you have a choice. We're not going to force you to go to our church, but we're going to force you to go to church. We're going to force you to observe Sunday as a holiday throughout America. This is, the, this is what is in the heart of so many people. Now, she probably let some stuff slip out earlier than she should have, but this is actually happening more and more. This conversation is taking place, and it's happening stealthily right now. But when it's time to start, in fact, it's interesting, uh, politically, on the left, their big concern is climate change. And you know what they say? Have a su climate day Sunday, right? A day where basically everything shuts down and makes it so nice for, uh, you know, where the, the cars aren't working, the factories are closed down. Just one day a week, we could do this and we can, we can help save our planet. They don't even care about the religious side of it, but Sunday is a good day to do that on. And so they, they, they call that... Um, I forget what they call it, something Sunday. Anyway, then you have on the other side of the spectrum, the right side, they, they, don't, they don't care about the climate change. They care about the family unit, right? And so they're saying, we need Sunday observance because our family moral values and, and, and the fabric of our society is breaking down. And so we need Sunday. And you know what? We agree. All Everybody agrees on Sunday. But friends, this is dangerous because this is exactly what Satan wants because it's going to put, and by the way, I don't, I don't care. You know, if you, want to, if you don't want to work on Sunday, that's up to you. My Bible tells me work six days, so I think we should always work six days a week, whatever that means for you. But the Sabbath is God's true rest day. So that being said, you know you don't have to go out there and go to work on Sunday if they tell you don't go work on Sunday. But that doesn't mean you can break the Sabbath. But people are so caught up with money these days. Oh well, if I can't if I can't work on Sunday, well, and God says I can't work on Saturday. I, I'd rather compromise and work on Saturday, right? And so people will give in. They'll give in to that temptation. But remember, God has a sign to say these are my people. Sabbath keeping people. He has all throughout history. He still does today. Revelation 13 4 says, They worship the dragon, which gave power to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who's like the beast? Who's able to make war with him? And he makes this very clear. Friends, if you worship the beast, you're actually worshiping the dragon. Who, which is who, by the way? You see how Satan has always wanted your worship? Since the time in heaven, when he first opposed God, he has wanted worship. He has wanted loyalty. He's wanted people to obey him. And now in the final generation of earth's history, he's not just getting most of the world to obey him, but now he's also getting Christians, professed followers of Jesus, to do what he says. He's setting up his laws above God's laws. And you know what he's doing? He's having success. So friends, the Sabbath is a last day test of loyalty and true worship. The seventh day is the true Sabbath. The first day is the counterfeit Sabbath. So my question is tonight, are you observing Sunday, that the, which is the day the Pope made holy, so-called, or are you, um, I, mean, I asked the question wrong, if you're observing Sunday, and that's the day the Pope made holy, are you not worshiping him? If you're listening to the Pope over Jesus, who are you actually worshiping? And that's why worship has to do with obedience and, and, and uh, loyalty more than actually, you know, Singing, which again, I'm not opposed to singing. I love singing, but I'm just, you get my idea. It's not a matter of one day or another. It's a matter of authority and loyalty made ob evident in obedience. You know, in, in a second, I'm going to talk about the United States of America and the role that it's going to play in these last days. But before I do that, I just want to make, make, make this point because I think this really will drive home the, the reality about um, how important the Sabbath is, okay? If you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Exodus chapter 16. Exodus 16. This is, remember the children of Israel 
were brought out of the land of captivity. God had a plan to bring them into the promised land. But before they could go into the promised land, God had a test for them. Okay? This is Exodus chapter 16. You might remember, this is a couple weeks before the Ten Commandments was given. They had just crossed over the Red Sea on dry land, and God was going to test them. A test before you go to the promised land. You ready to see what this test is? Look here in Exodus chapter 16, looking in verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them whether they will walk on my law or not. Now, chew on that for a second. God says, I'm going to test them whether they're going to walk in my law or not. But the test didn't have to do with his entire law. His test had to do with one single law that showed their whole attitude to God's whole law. Does that make sense? In verse 5, it says, and, they, and it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gathered. So you guys know the story about the manna. Manna came down six days a week. What happened if I carried the manna over from one night to the next? It would spoil. But on the sixth day, God said, go out and gather twice as much, and then it would not spoil on Friday night. And you wake up Saturday morning, guess what? How much manna is out there Saturday morning? No manna at all. And you know, what happened is, and actually, let's just read the story here. Let's skip on down to verse uh, 23, and he said to them, Today is this Lord, today, sorry, verse 23. This he said to them, This is what the Lord has said. To tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, the holy Sabbath of the Lord. Bake what you'll bake today, boil what you'll boil, and lay up for yourselves till, um, until morning. So they laid up till morning as Moses commanded, and it did not stink, nor were there any worms in it. Then Moses said, Eat that today, for today is the Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day of the Sabbath there will be none. Now listen, this is a sad story. Now it happened that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather and they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? Now, does that seem fair? I mean, a lot of people say, well, that's not fair. How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? They broke one commandment by going out and trying to gather on the Sabbath and God told them not to. They broke one commandment. And he says, how long do you refuse to break my commandments? How, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? Do you see by breaking that one Sabbath commandment, they were showing an attitude toward God's whole law? Here's where the lesson really comes home to today. Do you know that they, were, they ate manna all through the wilderness? That means that every Sabbath, they learned the lesson that God provides for them on Friday. You keep the Sabbath. Sunday's a regular working day. Go get, go get your manna, right? Now, get this. At the end of their time, right as they were going into the promised land, guess what? No more manna. The manna stopped. They were in the promised land. Now watch this, guys. They were to gather that manna. They were to put it into a golden bowl, and they were to put it where? Does anybody know? In the Ark of the Covenant. And they were to put it in what room of the sanctuary? The most holy place. Now this is where it comes fascinating to me, because here we are, we're in the last days of earth's history. We are in the time when the Bible would say we're in the day of atonement, the antitypical day of atonement. We are in the the time of atonement where Jesus went from the holy place, now he's in the most holy place, getting ready to take off his priestly garments, put on his kingly garments, and come back and, and save us, okay? So we are in the time of the day of atonement. We are in the most holy place experience where the Ark of the Covenant has the Ten Commandments with a golden bowl of manna that reminds us of the Sabbath as a test for God's people in these last days. And Aaron's rod that budded, which shows God's authority as he delegates it to his people in the leadership. That's another story. So do you see what I'm saying about how God has the Sabbath as a test for us in these last days, just like he did as he had for bringing them into the promised land? I just praise God. Is that, that, that's so clear to me. Now let's just talk real quickly here about the United States, and then we're going to go eat. question is, is the United States in Bible prophecy? This is, I, I usually have a whole message on this. I'm condensing it down to about 10 minutes. I'm going to try. So, nation... This nation is a pretty cool nation. What do you guys think? You like America? I love America. I've been to other countries. Let me tell you, I'm always glad when I come back home to America. But the Bible, I believe, is it talks about the second beast of Revelation 13. I believe it talks about these United States. Let's go ahead and look here in Revelation chapter 13, beginning in verse 11. It says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. So the first beast, remember, was the Roman Catholic Church system. That was the first beast. This one is different. It's another beast. Comes up from where? The earth. 
And it says it had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. Very important to understand the difference there, because this, let me just say this, this is a mixture of Christianity and, well, you can call it Satanism, but the world, okay? Look at this. Look, it says two horns like a lamb. What's a lamb represent in the Bible? Jesus, right? In fact, 28 times the word lamb is used in Revelation. This is the only time it's not a direct reference to Jesus, but it's still an allusion to Jesus. This has, a, this has lamb-like horns. See a picture of a buffalo there? It's amazing to have a beast so big with such little itty-bitty horns. <laughs> two horns like a lamb. I don't know if this is what it represents or not, but I'll tell you, it fits. It says, he exercises all authority of the first beast in his presence and cause, causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So the second beast is responsible for helping people to worship the first beast and do what the first beast says. So here's some points I want you to notice. It comes up from the earth. Now, the Bible says that water represents multitudes of nations, tongues, and people. It's the opposite of water is the earth, which means a desolated place or a place where... Um, there's not going to be a lot of people, okay? In our next session, we're going to talk about how the, the church fled into the wilderness. The wilderness, the earth, how the earth helped her, swallowed up the water. Here you find that the, an unpopulated uh, centers, when people came to America, right, from, from Europe, they began to colonize this country. Do you realize there's more Native American people in this country now than there was back whenever they began to colonize? This, and I'm not saying that there weren't people here. My, my ancestors are Native Americans, okay? So I, I, I very much don't like all the persecution that took place there. But I'm going to tell you this. According to prophecy, a nation would rise up not from population centers, but from a relatively unpopulated area. And it says it, it would eventually save God's people from persecution. It also would have lamb-like horns. As I, as I mentioned, the Christian-like nation. This is going to be a nation. Remember, every beast in the Bible is a, is a kingdom, right? And this one would be a Christian-like kingdom that would eventually speak like a dragon. The dragon is Satan. So it would start out as a Christian nation, would begin to turn more satanic. Um, and then it has no crowns on the horns. Very significant. You look at the first beast, there was crowns on all the horns. This beast has no crowns, meaning it would not have a king over it. In fact, it had two horns like a lamb. The two great principles upon which this nation was founded is, is two great, oh, I mean, I love these principles. One of them, it didn't have a king, and the other one, it didn't have a pope. This nation was founded upon as, as a Protestant nation, and it was also founded as a republic, as opposed to a, 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 a kingly authority, a kingly country. Um, a monarchy is the word I'm looking for. It would also rise up as the... At, on the world stage as the, at the end of the dark ages. This is important because if you re look in Revelation chapter 13, you see as the second beast is coming up, the first beast is going down. Did you notice that? Revelation 13, looking in verse 10, it says, He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with a sword must be killed with a sword. Here's the patience and faith of the saints. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. So while the first beast was going into captivity, which we know happened in 1798, the second beast is coming up, in, coming up out of obscurity. 1798, very interesting point in history where this country was just getting founded. In fact, it was, it was 1776 that we declared independence. It wasn't until the 1790s that this country began to have a constitution and a bill of rights and began to form as a nation. It would be one nation under God, again with the lamb-like horns. It would be a refuge for the persecutor. I mentioned that, a, a republic with no king. So all these points, points to this country as... The, as, as the second beast of Revelation. But it says the second beast would work with the first beast. Now I'm going to share with you guys something about uh, this first beast. Because it says here, this little side, this first beast says in verse uh, 3, it says, I saw one of his heads as it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. Remember how in 1798, the Roman Catholic Church went into captivity, right? The political power of the Roman Catholic Church was broken. But you know, the Mussolini and uh, Gaspari here signed a historic Roman pact in 1929 called the Lateran Treaty. And when this was signed, get, get, by the way, they put out in the newspapers this thing right here, heal, a uh, wound heal of many years. Heal, this is exactly the biblical language. The wound would be healed, right? This is what this, the newspapers were saying. And so this was coming into power, right? The Catholic Church is coming back into power. And you know what's happened since then? This country has begun to work with the Roman Catholic Church. 
And then in, historically, this country was actually pretty much anti-Catholic. And I don't mean it in the, in the sense of like hating Catholics, but they were afraid of what the Catholic Church would do if they had influence in this country. Because historically, every time the Catholic Church was in power, they always led to persecution. When the Catholic Church had authority, they would, they would kill people and hurt people and persecute people who didn't agree with them. So they didn't like that form of government. They said no to the Catholics, okay? In fact, one time the Pope sent, I think it was back in Abraham Lincoln's day, the Pope sent uh, kind of an emerald or a jewel over to this a nation to say congratulations on your election, and they threw it in the Potomac River and said, we don't want anything from the Antichrist. It was, this was an attitude back in the day. So, But here back in 1982, you see Ronald Reagan working with the Pope to bring down the Soviet Union. And sure, here they call it the Holy Alliance, Time Magazine, 1992. And this happened so many times where the Catholic Church in the United States has been working together. And right now, I've, I've never seen it in my lifetime, right now, the, the Roman Catholic Church is basically getting so involved in every political affair in this, in this world to where you know, he wants to go meet with, with Vladimir Putin and, and solve this crisis in Ukraine. and, and all. Just, he wants to be involved in all these different things. But you understand, this nation was founded on the principle of freedom. Here's what Thomas Jefferson, the one who actually uh, wrote the Constitution for the most part, believing that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions. I contemplate with sovereign reverence that the act of the whole American people which declared their that their legislators should make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall between church and state. That was a lot of words simply to say that Thomas Jefferson was saying this. The First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution which is right there. The First Amendment and the Bill of Rights that Congress should make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, that that basically separates church and state. There's a wall of separation. But you know what? Here's what's happening today. We're hearing from the Catholics, time has come to restore the vital relationship between the church and the state, between religion and law. That, that, and in fact, most are saying that wall of separation, church and state, should not exist. Here's what one of the, uh, one of the largest evangelical TV networks, um, I don't you mind if I say his name? You've heard of Paul Crouch? This is what he said, okay? He said, I'm eradicating the word Protestant even out of my vocabulary. I'm not protesting anything, he said. It's time for Catholics and non-Catholics to come together as one in the Spirit and one in the Lord. It's time for Protestants to go ahead, to go to the shepherd, talking about the Pope, and say, we have done, uh, what do we have to do to come home? Now, again, those of you who know your Bible say, well, that's, that's kind of way far out there. But the reality is, most Christians are like, why can't we all just get along? Let's just put aside our differences and just agree together. And by the way, this happened not too long ago uh, with Kenneth Copeland and a few others. They're really coming together. They went up, went over to the Vatican. Oh, I could say so much more, but I don't really have time to get to it. James Madison said, the purpose of separation of church and state is to keep forever from these shores the ceaseless strife that has soaked the soil of Europe with blood for centuries. Believing that religion is a matter, as Thomas Jefferson again, believing that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legitimate powers of government, uh, well, actually, I already quoted this one, didn't I? I'm going to skip that through there since I already got that quote in there. But here's what Richard McNoon said. This is a, a commentary on about what, what he said. He said, if Thomas Jefferson were alive today, I believe the world would not only lead the struggle to, to the scale of the wall of separation, but that he would also provide the ladder. Which is this idea of saying that Thomas Jefferson would not even agree with the wall of separation of church and state anymore. But that's just not true, friends. The time has come to restore... I, I don't know why I've got my, uh, my slides in here twice. I'm going to skip through those since I already did it. Let's go on to talk about this uh, verse, uh, verses 15 here, Revelation 13. Going on to talk about the United States again. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Now let me say something about the image of the beast. I'm so, I know I'm saying a lot. I'm trying to wrap this up. The image of the beast is an image to the beast. The beast, we know as the Roman Catholic Church, is a combination of church and state. Eventually, this country will form an image to that beast in that it will also unite church and state together by enforcing religious laws. When this country enforces the mark of the beast, we will have formed an image to the beast. If you have a, a picture in your wallet or on your phone, an image doesn't mean that it is that person. It means it looks like that person. In the same way, this country is not going to become Roman Catholic. This country is going to act Roman Catholic in the sense that it unites church and state 
together. And then, by, and by doing so, enforcing religious laws. And if, you, and if you don't worship the way that the first beast is telling you to worship, this country is going to enforce the, the Catholic Church's laws of Sunday worship. If not, he will cause all, both rich and small, great and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And no one may buy or sell except he who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Wow, friends. Or the number of his name right there. The number of his name. Listen, this is a counterfeit. The Antichrist wants to put his number in your forehead. His, not his number, his name in your forehead, right? He wants you to receive his name. Name represents character. What is the seal of God? The seal of God is that he wants his name in your forehead. Look at this, guys. I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion with him, 144,000, having his father's name written on their forehead. If we're going to survive the crisis in these last days, friends, we need God's name in our forehead. That's his character in our life. That's us following and doing everything that God says to do. But Satan wants you to have his name or the name of the beast in his forehead, in your forehead. So friends, let me tell you right now, we have a choice to make. A choice to follow Jesus all the way. I mean, we can't be partial Christians. We can't be halfway Christians. We can't be on the fence. That hurts. We've got to make a decision and get all the way over on the side of Christ. Surrendering self, surrendering sin, surrendering it all to Jesus. Because let me tell you, if we cannot today make a decision to follow Jesus and overcome sin today, my question is, how in the world do we think we're going to do it when the mark of the beast becomes a great issue? If we can't obey him now, how are we going to obey him then? That's why I'm saying today make a decision. Today don't put off a decision for Jesus. Amen? He's inviting you to put the Father's name in your forehead. And we do that by saying yes, Jesus, to all his commands. You want the seal of God? Read the Ten Commandments. Obey them because you love Jesus. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you, thank you, thank you that we have uh, your, 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 this truth that you've told us in advance so that we know when it comes to pass what side to take on, what side to take. And God, I just pray that you give us holy boldness and courage as we prepare for that crisis. Thank you, Father, for these precious promises. As we go to eat together, Lord, we want to thank you for providing the food. We want to thank you for those who prepared the food, Lord, and we just want to give you praise for being our provider. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, friends, please uh, don't take too long to eat.